Graham, big announcement this morning. Yep. Won't steal any thunder. So perhaps you can share um, share what was announced uh, with uh, with the audience here. Yes. So uh, it's a good afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks, uh, thanks, Thomas, for uh, letting me uh, talk a little bit about Pearson's journey. Um, uh, uh, if I may, I'll take you back about two years actually to. Uh, a discussion that we had with our, uh, our then uh, CEO, Marjorie Scardino, uh, and a few of the executive team about uh, the very question of pace and relevancy for a company that can trace its roots back nearly 200 years in, in, a, in a market that's moving very quickly. Our primary business is education uh, and uh, learning. And it's an industry that's going through a huge amount of change. It's becoming digitized, it's becoming global, and that's reflected in our, our business performance. To give you an example of that, in 2006, our revenues from digital and services, as we would term it, was 29%. In 2012, those same revenues were 50%. So while the perception might be that we're a physical product company, in fact, the reality is quite different. And that need to remain relevant and to have pace within uh, our marketplaces and, all, and increasingly collect, connect people together to solve some of the big problems in education, uh, and there are some very big problems globally, uh, was a, a major driving force for what we needed to do to kind of re-engineer and rewire the inside of the company. Um, we undertook a rather unusual route, which I'll expand a, bit, a little bit on uh, later, uh, but overall we decided that actually what we needed to do was to introduce a platform that would be any device, any access, any location, uh, that led us down a path of embracing things that are generally quite uncomfortable for many corporate IT uh, departments, mobile, social, and cloud. Now, two years ago, and even today, that has some challenges in terms of how you deal with that within your regulatory burden. Uh, and we're a heavily regulated company. Um, we chose to take that challenge on. Uh, we chose to do it because it was the right thing for our customers and it was the right thing for our learners. And over the course of the next two years, we worked with that group of people to come up with a platform that they felt comfortable with. And as a consequence, we're now in a position where today we have over 33,000 people in 1,000 different locations in 60 countries around the world who are using the Google uh, Enterprise platform. Uh, that's a massive transformation from where we were, where we had many disparate systems, a lot of old uh, on-prem Exchange 2003, we're a very acquisitive company, so we had a large amount of technical debt. And we've cleaned all that up to get everybody to a place where they're all operating on that one platform in real time. And by July, when we finish the program, we'll have migrated over 40,000 people. What about your end users in terms of the overall approach? I think a lot of people talk about communication and change management. Mm. Where did you invest your level of effort mm. pre-cutting people over to the platform? Yeah, we spent a, a, a huge amount of time in two particular places. The, at the very start of the process, we used a series of iterative techniques, show and tell, to really engage our users in this, was this the right platform for them? So we effectively went through about an eight weeks uh, series of sprints every two weeks. We engaged about 50 business leaders from across the company uh, globally who gave up their time very kindly at unsociable hours of the day and night. Uh, to, to engage in this process. At the end of it, we got their buy-in to say, that's the platform we want. We love the concept. Now, can you make it real? Can you industrialize it? The next challenge really came in that industrialization. We, we chose to, to really focus on migration on the basis that this was the first touch point and the first experience that anybody would have with the platform. If we got that wrong, it would tarnish everything that went beyond. So we spent an enormous amount of time uh, focusing on that process. And we set the team some very, very stringent uh, criteria. They had to be able to migrate 2,500 people a week, and they had to be able to do that globally. Now, that in itself is a bit of a challenge with time zones and, and various other things. But we also set them a very stringent target about you could not have an error rate beyond 1%. And by error, we meant anybody being disrupted beyond the business day that they were migrated. The migration happens overnight. Everything had to be fixed that day, and it couldn't extend beyond that. Um, in fact, what the team actually did was they got to a position where they could do four to 5,000 people a week, and in fact, they do believe they can do 8,000 a week, mm -hmm. and the error rates are actually down below 0.3%. It's generated a huge amount of customer goodwill, because many people are worried about the change, and you know, will it be a disruption, and you know, get in the way. 
Uh, and it's a very, very carefully orchestrated and very well thought out process that the team have designed themselves, they've designed a lot of the technology, and we get a huge amount of very positive customer feedback uh, from that process. And you know, you've, you're currently moving over these, these last years, as you mentioned, uh, by the end of July. Mm. If, I'm, if I look at one of the, the key applications or one of the key solutions that your end users would, would say has helped them do their work more effectively mm. or more productively, would you, what would you pick out as the one or two things that have really benefited them? Yeah, there's two particular features. Um, we, we chose to really exploit the platform to make it vibrant and to uh, have a policy of continually introducing new features as fast as we could. Uh, and the, really the policy behind that was to try and regain the credibility of the internal IT that when you went to work, there was a time when your IT was better in the company than it was at home. It's quite a number of years since that's been the case, I think we'll all agree. We set ourselves up as a sort of personal mission to see if we could get that back to a position where work was better. To do that, we needed to be vibrant, which we needed, meant we needed to introduce new features. Um, the two that have really resonated with our users beyond the core sort of mail and calendar have been uh, Hangouts and, and, and Drive. Hangouts in particular have gone completely viral around the company. As soon as somebody gets involved with it and a team realizes it's there, mm. that's it. And nowadays, if you take our own technical teams, it's very rare to see anybody do uh, a voice conference. Everything's done on Hangouts. And in terms of the, the attraction of people to both your IT team and the organization, I mean, the term of digital workplace, mm -hmm. have you seen an increase in people when they come to Pearson and ask you the question about, well, what is your end computing strategy? Mm -hmm. And from an IT perspective, look, what are the tools that we support? Has there been any difference in terms of questioning of when they come in? Uh, yeah, uh, the first question we get is, really? We can do that? We can bring our own devices, we can have choice, we can have choice in our tools. You introduce all these new things, hey, this is really good. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a huge perception uh, uh, enhancer in terms of uh, the IT organization itself, so the organization I run, but also the, the wider company in terms of how it's perceived within the technology industry, mm. when we're attracting talent, you know, and a, a, as a digital company, we have a huge need for software engineers. We have 5,000 software engineers in the company, mm. so you know, we're not insignificant in that market. Being able to offer them the tools of their choice, the choice of devices, even the, ch the choice of tools and services is a, is a major uh, advantage, and it was mm. one of the things that our executive team wanted out of the whole platform. So, so you've done a great job. You come to a, a pretty you know, important milestone in July. So your new CEO, <laughs> what are they asking you to do? What, what are some of your big bets for the next kind of one or two years? Uh, next big bets, uh, really they're in three areas. Um, hybrid cloud, uh, so the ability to kind of do the same transformation on infrastructure mm. and heavy lifting components in order to get products and services out to a truly global audience. Uh, and to do that fast and in a totally scalable way. You know, how do you deal with one billion learners, for yeah. example? Uh, hybrid cloud is a big area that we're investing a lot of time in. Uh, the piece that falls off the back of that is data. You know, our core business of education, there's an enormous opportunity to change educational outcomes and improve education around the world through the use of data. We have one of the largest data sets in the world uh, around learning. Uh, the ability to exploit that, to grow it, to gain insight, and to make that available to an increasingly large community through a lot of open activity that we're doing is, is a huge opportunity for us. And last but not least, um, internal transformation of our service environment. Mm. Uh, so we have this fantastic end user computing environment, we have this you know, emerging infrastructure play. What can we do to really do an overhaul and bring our entire service environment into, uh, into the 21st cloud age and make it social and mobile and, and relevant to our user groups? And those are the areas we're really concentrating on. So, you know, I mentioned joining Pearson mm -hmm. and in three or six months time, I, I walk in the door as an end user. What's it like to work there? What is the cultural feel that you're looking to try and achieve? And, and what, what do I get when I join? The, 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 outcome, uh, the outcome we sort of agreed when we, when we spoke to the executive team, the way that we summarized it was we wanted to take everybody back to campus. We wanted to take everybody back to what it was like for one of our customers, uh, a student, to be working and playing and living in an, in an environment that would be akin to a, a large university campus. 
So we've based everything around mobile, it's social, it's all about your services, that's, that your entire world is encapsulated in there. But it's a world that's, that's protected and secure, but at the, mean, at the same time is, is available for you to just live your life mm. and do your work and, and learn and, and, uh, and prosper. And that's really what we try to do. So, you know, we've abandoned things like fixed phones, for example. Uh, we've moved over to smartphones we've, in building coverage. We've removed our investments in land technology. We've invested everything in WLAN. Uh, and we're really just trying to reimagine the whole workspace. Mm. So when you move into one of our offices, it feels quite different. You know, if you're coming out of university, it feels quite familiar, actually. Mm. Uh, and that's a big transformation for a company that, yeah. you know, has to, you know, gone through many, many generations of, of, yeah. of workforce. One of, the, um, one of the questions I'm asked almost every day is, if I understand the vision, I understand your strategy, I have a real appetite to do something, is where do I start? How do I actually get a business case that can cover technical and business and this kind of cultural elements? Where did you start? Well, we started with our customers and our learners. Really, we really got their buy-in. And I think one of the great things about cloud technology is you don't have to put huge amounts of upfront investment into mm -hmm. establishing the concept, gaining buy-in, and validating that it's actually what your users are going to want. Mm -hmm. Once you've done that, your business case is a lot easier because you're not actually investing huge amounts of upfront cash in hard assets in the way that you would have before yes. with the prospect that you might not get to any sort of benefits realization mm -hmm. within two years. So the, the opportunity to engage the users, validate the benefits, and start to exploit the benefits at a much earlier stage with a lower level of investment is a huge, huge benefit when you, uh, when you actually come to, uh, uh, to, to do this. In terms of our uh, the, the complexities of it, the, the only issues really we struggled with were actually validating what the true cost of operation is for an on-prem solution. There are so many aspects that people forget uh, and they don't get factored in and therefore your costs go all over the mm. place. Uh, once we got past that and we now got a bit of a crib sheet for it, mm. it became a bit of a no-brainer really. Okay. Why would you spend all this money mm. you know, on something when you can just grow your usage in line with your, your needs?